Well, it's not Nick Saban versus Davo Swinney, but Alabama and Clemson advance to set up an epic Elite Eight battle on Saturday. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, folks? Happy Friday. Happy Thursday evening to those of you joining us on the West Coast. It is after uh, after Thursday on the East Coast there as we're recording here. Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, a daily national college hoop show, part, of course, of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are your co-hosts. I'm Andy Patton. He is Isaac Shade. You are joining us at the place to get the best college basketball content every single day. Folks, we want to thank all of you for making this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. And remind you all to join us on Amazon. You can listen ad-free on Amazon Music. Phenomenal partnership with them. So definitely go check out the show there if you want to listen without those ads. A uh, special, special shout out, of course, to all of you everydayers and those of you who are joining us here live on Thursday evening slash Friday morning. Today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by Nissan. Folks, are you the kind of driver that likes to push things just a little bit further? Have you ever wondered what adventure could be just around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. Well, Isaac, we're going to recap the West and East region Sweet 16 battles, talk about the four teams that have advanced to the Elite Eight. We're also going to have some discussion on Andy Enfield leaving USC for the Southern Methodist job. Some more Smew. transfer portal. Yes, right. Some more transfer portal updates as well. A big piece leaving the Kentucky Wildcats. We're going to get into all of that. But Isaac, we talked so much leading up to this day and leading up to this, uh, you know, this weekend of Sweet 16 games about how. We had all the one seeds and all the two seeds still intact. Eight of these Sweet 16 spots belonged to the top two seeds in the regions. And yet, here we are after one day, and that's nearly cut in half as three of those top eight seeded teams lose. Uh, Number one seed UNC goes down to Alabama, Iowa State. Two seed goes down to Illinois. And then Arizona goes down to Clemson. And we're going to start in the West region. And I want to start with this loss by North Carolina, the first number one seed to go down. We talked coming into this game, the big storyline was whether Alabama's defense was going to be able to do enough to stop North Carolina's offense. And I'm not sure that we actually got an answer to that. I mean, North Carolina scored 87 points. Uh, RJ Davis had a, a very poor shooting night, and that was pretty clearly what did Carolina in. But ultimately, it's kind of a, a you could kind of argue it either way because, yes, I, I think North Carolina's offense definitely didn't do what they're capable of doing. Baycott was inconsistent in the game there was a ton of missed bunnies really on both sides of this game uh davis we mentioned uh, he was i think what four of 20 from the field in this game but at the same time i thought north carolina might be able to do a little bit more defensively than giving alabama a chance to pretty much score 90 they end up finishing with 89 what were your kind of thoughts uh you know knowing what we kind of talked about pre-game and then what ended up uh coming to fruition in this one yeah andy i like how you put that did we get an answer? I don't yeah. know. We did. You know, like it, it, and that's the funny thing about this game. I mean, this is sports, Andy. Mm-hmm. RJ Davis, you talked about it, has hit at least one three in every game this college basketball season, except for Thursday night. Literally the first time all season, he's not made a three. And that's college basketball. You know, yeah. five different Tar Heels make a three and none of them were named RJ Davis, the ACC player of the year. Uh, and so that's that's what sports does, man. And that's that's for non Tar Heels fans. That's the beauty, or for third party people mm-hmm. watching that don't have a dog in the race. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. For Alabama fans, that's the elation of it. For North Carolina mm-hmm. fans, that's the misery of it. That's yeah. the beauty, uh, the the agony and the ecstasy of mm-hmm. what we get to go through and why we love this so much. Yeah, um, yeah. Grant Grant Nelson, I think, was was really the big storyline for for Alabama in this one. I think the R.J. Davis right. storyline is is going to get a lot of attention, and we'll kind of talk about pairing it with the Caleb Love situation because Caleb Love, frankly, had a had a poor game as and well for Arizona. Right. Those two guys combined to shoot oh of eighteen from three. A very unfortunate situation for two team leaders, two you know well respected players in college basketball. I hate to see this for Davis. I hate to see this for Love. But before we get into that, I think we we got to talk about the celebration. Like you said, the ecstasy of it, and that is is Grant Nelson. I mean, twenty four points, twelve boards, five 
blocks in this game. And he did so much of his damage in the second half. And for Nelson, a player who, you know, a year and a half ago was all over the news for this dominant highlight reel video package that came out of him when he was playing at North Dakota State. And he declared for the NBA draft and he didn't look fast enough. He didn't quite look like he was ready for that competition level. He enters the portal. He goes to Alabama and he has a, a fine season like he wasn't great like he didn't set the SEC on fire by any stretch like he didn't didn't come close to Dalton Connect another mid-major transfer right. from right. you know the West Coast who, who comes out to to the SEC and dominates but but when Alabama needed him I mean Grant Nelson in the second half of this game he missed the final two free throws he took but he was 10 of 11 from the line up to that point he had a bunch of free throws down the stretch he had a possession where he stopped RJ Davis from scoring twice including volleyball spiking one of his oh. His, his lay-ins into the ground like that was a a dynamic performance from a player that while he has pedigree while he was an NBA draft prospect last year and will probably float on that conversation this year he, it's sort of an unsung player to like he's not the name I would have thrown out as like hey this is the guy who's gonna take over this game down the stretch and yet that's what happened yeah we would have thought it would have been Mark Sears and, yeah. and uh you know but I thought what Nate Oates did was so great they realized in the final six, seven minutes of the game that they had something that they could isolate with Nelson and that Carolina mm -hmm. was not stopping him. And so they just kept NBA style going to that, which you should absolutely do. Yeah. Meanwhile, I thought on the other side, North Carolina didn't do the same trying to take advantage of a hobbled Nick Sprinkle by going in the post Armando Baycott over and again, or earlier in the second half going at Grant Nelson when he picked up his third foul early in the second half mm -hmm. and Nados didn't take him out. And, and the Tar Heels didn't exploit that. So I thought some really good coaching decisions to exploit advantages on one end mm -hmm. and really poor decision making or, or lack thereof on the other end. And, and Andy, I thought we also got a good example in the final minute of this game of just how critically important every possession is and how much more that is highlighted this time of the year. And what I mean is North Carolina had come back from being down after that Grant Nelson run, had just quickly taken a lead. Um, had the ball up one with a minute left, 15 seconds left on the shot clock. Jalen Withers finds himself open at the top of the key. Mm -hmm. I would say probably the fifth option for North Carolina on the floor offensively at that point. He's open for a reason. Decides to take a three-point attempt with 15 seconds left on the shot clock when, honestly, he probably would have been better suited to just stand there and take a shot clock violation and get the, get the game clock down to 45 seconds. Yeah. And so, Andy... I would imagine that the North Carolina Tar Heels are ruining that decision. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I kind of teased about this in the, in the teaser opening there about these schools being primarily known for their football, but this is the first Elite Eight appearance for Alabama since 2004. It is their second Elite Eight appearance in school history. And for Clemson, and I want to kind of transition to talking about their game here, this is their second Elite Eight in program history as well, and their first since 1980 as the Tigers take down the Wildcats of Arizona. Uh, the Hunter brothers, what a phenomenal, phenomenal story this was for Chase Hunter. He had a phenomenal game for this team, and his brother ends up kind of sealing the deal with a lay-in and one lay-in at the very end of the game. And this was not like a, a miracle comeback for Clemson or Arizona blowing it down the stretch. Clemson led for 37 minutes right. That's absolutely of this right. game. I mean, they came out and just – they did kind of what they did to Baylor. They did what they did to New Mexico. This team is playing – not only great offensively and efficient and kind of getting multiple uh, good performances from, from multiple from players other than just PJ Hall, like they're having good games all around, but their defense, they've really clamped down. I mean, Baylor and Arizona are two of the best offenses in the country or defenses in the country, offenses in the country. Let's get that right. And Clemson's defense really did a phenomenal job against both of them. And, and uh, a, a huge shout out to Clemson. I was kind of thinking we were going to get an all ACC matchup there. Obviously, Carolina didn't deliver on their end. But for Clemson to be in the spot that they are, for, Bra uh, for Brad Brownell to have made the comments he made of like, you know, we think the ACC is better than it's getting credit for. Like the best way to prove that is to do exactly what they've done. They blasted a Big 12 team. They blasted a future Big 12 team in Arizona. Now here they are in the Elite Eight with an opportunity to take down an SEC team, potentially go to the Final Four. And, and Andy, you, you talked about how Clemson won this game. Air didn't, Arizona didn't lose it. Arizona didn't mm -hmm. choke it away. Clemson went out and got it. And even in the second half, as, as the Wildcats were making pushes and punches mm -hmm. and trying to get back, Clemson just kept making plays. I mean, really, really impressive. You talked about Chase Hunter. This mm -hmm. dude has led Clemson in scoring in all three games of the NCAA tournament. An all-time performance from him. 100% mm -hmm. it is. 
he is clicking at a completely new level Mm because PJ Hall was always there. The chef was always there. Joe Girard was always there. And now that Chase Hunter's doing it, that's what's making Clemson go in my estimation. And Andy, how, how wild that RJ Davis and Caleb Love on this night both end up having horrible shooting performances. Yeah. Who would who would have thunk it? But yeah. here we are where they're a combined O of 18 from three. Yeah, it was really rough to see both those guys who I think probably wanted this matchup more than anything in the world to not be able to deliver for their teams. It was rough. And we mentioned that Clemson won this game. That is absolutely true. But Arizona did not do themselves any favors. Their late game execution was was really rough. And on that final play, to not come up and, and commit a foul there, let the ball get passed ahead to Hunter, who had the and one lay in. Uh, just, to, I mean, I, I don't know if it was a brain lapse or what happened there, but I don't think it would have changed the the overall fortune of the game necessarily, but it was kind of shocking to see Arizona not execute the way we know they're capable of doing down the stretch. And, uh, you know, it's too early to have any serious conversations about Tommy Lloyd. The man is, I think, 88 and 19 in his first three seasons at Arizona. He's one of the most prolific winning coaches as a first year head coach through his first three years of all time, if not the most winning coach of all time. But to be perfectly honest, the the tournament experience has left something to be desired for the Wildcats. They have now lost uh, they've not advanced past the Sweet 16 despite being a one seed, a two seed, and a two seed in the three years of Tommy Lloyd's tenure. And they have lost uh, two seeds four or lower than them in every single tournament. They lost as a one seed to a five seed in 2022. They lost as a two seed to a 15 seed in Princeton in 2023. And then now as a two seed, they lose to a six seeded Clemson team. This is a trend that certainly Tommy Lloyd is going to have to fix lest he start to get a reputation as being somebody who who wins the majority of his games in the regular season. I think he's capable of doing it, but uh, three years in a row starts to starts to get some more questions. Yeah, at that point, it's a trend, Andy, and, and they're going to have to get some things figured out this offseason. Well, look, on the other side of the bracket, we had a uh, dominant performance from we didn't lose all our one and two seeds that played on <laughs> Thursday night. And in fact, it means the two best offenses in the nation advanced in the East region, setting up a high octane showdown on Saturday. More on that in just a second. But first, I need to tell you that this episode of Locked on College Basketball is brought to you by Manscaped, the spring cleaning champions. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below the waist grooming. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code Locked On for 20% off. A big fan of free shipping. I hate paying for shipping. Thanks, Manscaped. Their fifth generation trimmer features features two interchangeable next gen skin safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little off the top, and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. Spring cleaning doesn't just apply to the nether regions. Get the full grooming experience with Manscaped's signature Beard Hedger Pro Kit plus Handyman Electric Face Shaver. Whether you're looking to craft your signature look or clean up that neckline a little bit like I need to do right now, these are always the right tools for the job. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. Today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is also brought to you by Better Together. If your bracket is busted, but you want to stay in the game, then you have to be introduced to Better Together, the first cooperative daily fantasy platform where teamwork triumphs talent and you can play with your friends, not against them. Pick more or less on any real-time player stats, strategize with your partner to boost your odds, and climb the leaderboard together. So grab a friend and join the social DFS movement. Better Together also gives inexperienced players an immersive way to learn about DFS. Teaming up with and following the lead of an experienced friends and teammates in a team contest can help take away the fear of diving in for the first time. And for Locked On College Basketball fans, you need to show that you're the best players by participating in the Fan Challenge Series for a chance to win real money prizes. You can see the app for contest details. So download Better Together now from the App Store and sign up using promo code Locked On for a chance to win your share of over $1,000 in cash prizes. Play with me in a contest this weekend. Remember the code Locked On because winning is alone is fun, but it's better together. All right, Isaac, let's move out to the East region. We had the top two offenses in the country advancing here. The Yukon Huskies taken down San Diego State, a team they played last year in the national championship. I think it was like a 
14, 15 point victory in the championship game. This time, much bigger margin of victory for the Huskies. We'll get to that one. But first, start with the more exciting matchup in the East region. Illinois takes down number two seed Iowa State, 72 to 69 was the final score here. The Illini pretty much led the entire game, but it felt close all the way throughout. Iowa State kind of would get down 10, would get down 12, and would kind of fight their way back throughout this contest. Obviously, they're a very dynamic defensive team, and they often utilized a couple 6-0 runs, 8-0 runs, things like that to kind of keep themselves in the game. But Terrence Shannon Jr. was just too much for the Illini. He finishes with 29 points, 10 of 19 shooting. He was 4 of 10 from 3. He was strangely 5 of 10 from the free throw line. Illinois like completely forgot how to shoot free throws in this game. They were 15 of 29, just a shade over 50% in this contest. If you told me Illinois shot 51% from the free throw line against Iowa State, I don't think there's a chance that I would have projected that they won this game. But yet here they are advancing to the Elite Eight, a chance to take on UConn. Really nice win for Brad Underwood and the Illini. Well, Andy, and that's the thing. You combine what you just said about the free throws with the fact that Marcus Damask was 2 of 11 from the field, 0 of 4 from 3. And like coming into this game, you might even remember, Andy, earlier this week in our Sweet 16 preview, I flipped my choice for this game from mm-hmm. Iowa State to Illinois just based on what we've been seeing from Illinois. But if you, uh, for my estimation, it was because of both Shannon and Damask mm-hmm. doing yeah. what they did. And one of them held up their end of the bargain here, but Damask just didn't. And the free throw shooting, and yet Illinois did this? Andy, I am so impressed. Yeah. And part of it, too, is why the, the second half of this game was played incredibly in tight quarters in terms of scoring margin. Mm-hmm. Uh, Iowa State never got it closer than two because Illinois just kept making plays. And I know Iowa State had some missed opportunities, shall we say. Yeah, But just really impressive for Illinois to be able to just keep holding it off and keep doing enough to win. Now they're moving on to the Elite Eight. Yeah, Iowa State's key offensive players just didn't show up in a major way. Sean Gilbert had just one point in the first half of this game. He finished with 14, but he scored the majority of his points in like the first five to 10 minutes of the second half. Didn't do much at the late game. Didn't do virtually anything in the first half. Didn't help this team as much as he's capable of. Lipsy just had eight points in this one. Uh, They only really stayed in it because of Curtis Jones, who came off the bench and dropped 26. Really nice performance from him. You always love seeing those guys kind of come in and and have these, these, not necessarily out of nowhere performances he's been solid all year long but not the guy you expected uh, to be only behind Shannon in total points in this game but for Iowa State enough mistakes down the stretch uh, some key turnovers some missed shots around the rim that they just couldn't afford to miss Uh, and you know we we talked about that story of of Underwood talking about his conversation with Jay Wright and some adjustments he made to his offense And, and look this offense is cruising right now they only had 72 in this game which doesn't look great but against an Iowa State team that plays at their tempo that slows it down to, to do enough to, to win this ball game, and especially to do enough with missing 14 free throws in this game. Uh, it sets up Illinois for a fun matchup against UConn. There's going to be a whole bunch of points scored. Uh, it's hard to imagine anybody taking down UConn right now, especially after what they just did to San Diego State. But uh, Illinois is playing some great basketball right now, and I think if nothing else, that that's going to be an incredibly exciting game of basketball. <laughs> Way to spin it positive, Andy. Let's go <laughs> talk about that other game because, my dude, this national championship rematch mm-hmm. was not – uh, anything no. right like for me I look at the halftime score and I think you know I don't think UConn played a very good first half from what mm-hmm. I just watched from them by their standards and yet they're up by nine points if they get anything remotely figured out in the second half they're going to obliterate the Aztecs and Andy that's exactly what happened you yeah, know it was almost, yeah. uh, almost a self-fulfilling prophecy there I mean legitimately remember last season in the NCAA tournament, we were saying for the first time ever in history, a team has won all six NCAA tournament games in route to the national championship by 13 or more points. Mm-hmm. It's like they're doing better than that now. They might double dip on that, Andy. Mm-hmm. If they get three more wins by the same nature, it's just absurd, Andy. How, what, what did UConn do to just make work of Brian Dutcher's team? They're just overwhelming with the amount of talent they have at every position. I mean, Donovan Klingon did a good job of bottling up Ladee. He was the best player for San Diego State. He had 18 points, but he was 8 of 18 from the field. Uh, San Diego State overall shot under 23% from three. They shot under 36% from the field or right around 36% from the field. Like this team just did not have 
they couldn't score offensively because of Klingon's presence on defense because of Stefan Castle, who is a phenomenal on ball defensive player. And then Castle had 16 and 11 rebounds. He was five of eight from the field. Newton had 17 points, seven boards, four assists. Cam Spencer had 18 points, five boards, four assists and three steals. Like these guys just do they're they're all over the place. They're, they're doing things defensively. They're crashing the glass in ways that San Diego state wasn't able to kind of overcome. Like this team is so diverse in the way that they can beat you. Like, Stephen, Stephen Castle hasn't been the guy who's beat teams very often this year. And you, he, he didn't do it by himself in this game. But 16 and 11 is an, an awesome game for him to do as a freshman in an NCAA tournament game against a physical and experienced team. Like, that is an incredible line for Stephon Castle. And he feels like the guy that gets talked about the least unless you're in NBA draft circles talking <laughs> about this UConn team. And it's just when, when you're preparing for a team where you have no idea who's going to beat you on any given night and That's you know exactly that they're right. capable of taking you down uh, with four, five, six different guys at sometimes, like they're just, they're, they're just overwhelming. And, and I'm excited about this Illinois matchup because they have a lot of pieces, but UConn has taken down a lot of teams that are really good. And, and there's little reason to believe they're not capable of doing it again against the Illini. Yeah. I mean, Andy, this, this is a game in which Donovan Klingon had just eight points and yet UConn outscored San Diego State in the paint 38 to 18. And so they're just getting into the paint and, and doing work, making a habit of doing that. You talked about the glass. My goodness, Andy, UConn out-rebounded San Diego State 50 to 29. UConn had as many defensive rebounds as San Diego State had total rebounds, 29 to 21, 29. The Huskies had 21 Offensive rebounds, Andy Patton. That is absolutely absurd. Danny Hurley's team is rolling, and I do not know what somebody can put on the tracks to stop this freight train. Well, all right, we got to keep moving, folks. Andy Enfield is out at USC. He's headed to Dallas to be part of the ACC with SMU and a key player for John Calipari's Wildcats entered the NCAA transfer portal. We're going to get to all of that in a second. But first, this weekend's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our good friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that really stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest. Just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. We talked about them earlier, but the Clemson Tigers are obviously this week's Nissan Rogue. This team absolutely surprised us all with a powerful performance to get to the Elite Eight for the first time since 1980 and just the second time ever in a dominant, not dominating win over Arizona, but handled it really well. Mm -hmm. They say win life, go rogue. And that's exactly what the Tigers have done here. So take the Nissan Rogue, Pathfinder, or Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Andy, briefly, we've already talked about it some, but before, but before we get to a little bit of coaching carousel conversation, a little bit of transfer portal conversation, as you look ahead to Saturday's Elite Eight matchups, not necessarily tonight's Sweet 16 games, but as you look at this high-octane matchup in the East that you mentioned, UConn versus Illinois, um, the, the one in the West now, the, the football national championship game, if you will, Alabama versus Clemson, well, what sticks out to you about these two games? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's hard to not pick the two best offenses in the country going up against each other. That certainly is is the standout here. Um, I like the fact that we have four different teams from four different conferences here representing. You got the Big East, the ACC, the Big Ten, and the SEC all representing. Uh, the Big 12 being the conference that's not in this conversation and the Pac-12, both who had opportunities but did not take advantage of them. But uh, yeah, I think it's hard to pick against the the two best offenses. However, I am really intrigued by what we're going to see. Again, we mentioned it with Clemson. They've uh, stymied some really good offenses at Baylor and at Arizona already in this tournament. Can they do it again against perhaps the best challenge they're going to face just in terms of overall offensive output, which is the Crimson Tide? If Clemson can do that, I mean, at that point, you're looking at a team. I mean, are they a team of destiny? If they can get past that game all the way into the Final Four, I mean, they're probably going to have to take on UConn and that – that will truly be the greatest challenge that they would have to face. But uh, I, I'm excited to see those two uh, quote unquote football schools take each other on. Yeah. I mean, you get to this point and you look at it and just by the way, brackets work. It's like either Alabama or Clemson are going to be in the final four this year. Like that's mm -hmm. where we're at Andy. And how wild would it be for Alabama 
to make it to the final four the year after they were the number one overall yeah. seed, the year after Brandon Miller's gone, the year after Charles Bediaco's got, or like, mm-hmm. what a bonkers thing. What a great coaching job that would be from Nate Oates to keep this thing rolling. Speaking of coaches, Andy, shall we coach Carousel uh, just a little bit here? Andy yes. Enfield, after a, can I say, terrible year at USC? Is that is that a fair word to put on it? So. My goodness, especially given all their expectations this year with Bronny, mm-hmm. with all the, the, the talent returning, is leaving La La Land and heading to my wife's home state. So she's <laughs> going to want to make that a whole thing. To SMU, he's leaving Big Ten school to go to an ACC school. Um, so weird. <laughs> it, it is weird. And Andy, I'm almost more interested in having the conversation not about infield and SMU, but more about who takes his spot at, at USC, right? Like, who, who do you see on that docket? Yeah, USC is a really interesting job opening because it's obviously this huge, prestigious university. They're going to the Big Ten. They have a ton of money. They're in L.A. But it's also a school that hasn't had a lot of real – they're not a rich history of basketball success – at USC and Enfield did a good job of recruiting. They landed the Mobleys, they landed in Yeka Okongwu, they landed, of course, Isaiah Collier and Bronny James. Right. But right. like there's the recruiting has probably been boosted by NIL money. The the actual success on the basketball court has a, a small, relatively recent history. What does that mean in terms of how much money are they going to throw at a new coach? Like some names that pop up to me, everybody who I've talked to who's a USC fan, who, who's kind of invested in this, they want Brian Dutcher from San Diego State. I'm not sure I see it. I'm not sure I see what they could do to compel Dutcher to leave San Diego State with the success that he's having right now, back-to-back Sweet 16 appearances. Uh, Todd Golden, former coach at San Francisco, now the head coach at Florida. Same type of thing. Not sure USC has enough in the tank to to pull him away from Florida. He hadn't been there that long. They obviously would you ra- Andy, where would you rather be? Would you rather be at Florida or USC? I thought about this a lot today. It, you know, it's a, that's a really good question. I'd probably have to think even more about it. Uh, like not an off the cuff answer necessarily. Sure, sure. I think, I think you feel really good about how you can recruit in LA specifically. And I think that's a huge advantage, but not knowing exactly the NIL packages, like Florida might have more money that they're tossing at it. The SEC is a really good basketball conference right now. The Big Ten is as well, but USC stylistically doesn't really match up with the Big Ten. So I'm very curious how that's going to go. If I'm golden, like instead of moving back all the way to California, I'd probably just stay in Florida. I'm with you. I, that's exactly my thought. And I feel like he, like they took a big step forward this year, in yeah. my opinion. I know they got bounced last weekend, but yeah, I'm sticking it out in Gainesville if I'm him. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Well, um, we obviously know that Dusty May is out in Boca Raton. He's headed up to Ann Arbor, Michigan. (laughs) I haven't even thought about that till I just said that he's leaving Boca Raton sleepy retirement community (laughs) to go to the frozen tundra of Ann Arbor, Michigan. So FAU follows it up by hiring Baylor assistant, John Jacobs, um, to take over there for Dusty May. Andy, do you think that the Owls, who lose their coach mm-hmm. and probably the vast majority of all that talent that came back this year, can they keep it going in the American Athletic Conference? I like this hire a lot because uh, you're hiring out of the boat, the Baylor coaching tree, and that has been incredibly fruitful. You have Jerome Tang, who took Kansas State to Elite Eight in his first year. You had Grant McCaslin, who turned around a Texas Tech program that was in pretty significant disarray. Uh, you had Paul Mills, who led Oral Roberts to the Sweet 16 as a 15 seed. Now he's at Wichita State. Last year didn't go great, uh, but I have a feeling that the Shockers are going to be back around here in no time. So uh, I'm hiring whoever's the associate head coach at Baylor. If, if I can, I'm just making that hire every single time. Jackis has been at Baylor since 2017, I believe. Um, he was there before that as well. He was also the director of basketball ops at Gonzaga for three years. So the, th- the two coaches he's learned under are Mark Few and Scott Drew. Hard to not feel pretty good about that. Uh, I like this hire for Florida Atlantic. They're taking a shot on somebody who's who's a young, unproven, but uh, that's kind of how you can grow and, and, and really build a powerhouse program if you're willing to take those risks. Ooh, Andy, a couple of, a couple of interesting transfer portal entries on Thursday. I've lost complete track of what days are. Um, <laughs> Wisconsin gets bounced, and AJ Store is in the transfer portal. He's also declared for the NBA draft. Why wouldn't you check yeah. that out? And uh, man, what what a thing he was for Wisconsin this year. Aduthiero from Kentucky jumps in the portal. So man, I I don't know what Kentucky's going to be this mm-hmm. offseason, Andy. That's going to be a very interesting thing to watch, as expected. 
as we joked about the second it happened, Tucker DeVries is Mm -hmm. heading with his dad to West Virginia. Really curious to see how his game translates to the Big 12 level. He's not exactly performed great in the NCAA tournament the last two years. So that's going to be a thing to watch as well. Uh, Joshua Jefferson enters the transfer portal from St. Mary's. Had that unfortunate injury uh, down the stretch this year. And that seems like a pretty big loss for the Gales to me. Yeah, it's a huge loss for the Gales. Uh, they're already going to lose Alex Dukas. They're starting three. They're going to lose Mason Forbes, who was the player who replaced him in the starting lineup. This is a really tough loss for St. Mary's, and I, it, it, it was a complete shock. I know a lot of St. Mary's fans, and, and nobody expected this. So that's a huge bummer for the Gales, programs like that. You know, they got a good recruiting class coming in, but it is tough to lose guys like that. So I, I feel for Randy Ben and the Gales, this is uh, going to be a hard player to replace. And then perhaps the most hilarious transfer portal news I've seen this entire transfer portal season, and it's only been going on for two weeks. Marcus Adams Jr. is leaving BYU. And Andy, for folks who don't remember, could you just briefly run us through that wonky timeline of his from last summer? Yeah, Marcus Adams Jr. committed to Kansas initially, and he enrolled in classes over the summer, which meant when he decided he didn't want to be at Kansas anymore, he could not just uh, decommit and recommit elsewhere. So he ended up transferring to Gonzaga. Uh, uh, Three weeks later, he transferred away from Gonzaga. The reports were that he was never even on campus. Not sure whether it was an academic thing, whether it was a he just decided to change his mind, whatever the situation was. Ends up transferring to BYU, spends most of the year sitting, plays, I think, very sparing for the Cougars at times this year. Now he's back in the transfer portal, fourth school in eight months, depending on when he, I guess, chooses his next school. Could be nine months if he waits a while. But uh, yeah, he's this is a kid who's who's had some issues um, in his life, and so I don't want to drag on him too much. We see these stories quite a bit, but I do hope he finds somewhere that that he settles in and is able to play because he is very talented, but yeah, certainly uh, whatever school he does commit to is not necessarily going to feel super confident about how long he's going to end up being suited up for him. Folks, that's going to wrap it up for us today. We will be back on Friday night after the conclusion of the rest of the Sweet 16 games. We will then have a full picture of what the Elite Eight is going to look like. So come hang out with us after those games. You can join us live on Friday evening. You can also listen to the show on audio and video platforms afterwards as well. Join us on our Discord channel as well, where we're chatting throughout the games. You can come hang out there. The link is in the show notes on audio and video. Thanks again for listening. Apologies to the lawyer family. We'll get to them tomorrow. Let's go Wildcats, (laughs) even though their season is now over. And until tomorrow, peace.